Welcome everybody. Thanks for joining us for another MSL Capita Clinic. So today we're going to be talking a little bit more about the neuro athlete and how to really focus and maximize the the processes and the the work that goes into the mind and body pathway. So as we kind of get started, I'm Davis Turner. I'm the senior director at senior director of strategic programs at MindSpark Learning, and I'm excited to get started with you. So real quick, as we get started, MSL Capita is really for you, right? You, the coaches, the athletic directors, organizations, really focusing on who you wanna be and what you want to represent. And we're here to help you get there. I know coaches often don't get the support that they need in terms of training, in terms of you know knowledge, and, and some of that extrinsic stuff. So we're here to support you in that kind of journey. And it's it's a long journey and it's a it's a very fulfilling one if we do it properly. So let's continue into the neuro athlete. So as we get started, I'm just gonna let you read this quote real quick and then we'll kind of talk about it. So with that comes a lot of different things, right? We we talk about, you know seeing things we talk about interpreting things and and really it's vision and the concept and being able to contextualize the things that are going on around us and as we kind of look into our you know different systems and different things that play a part in how we process things that's when we're going to start seeing you know our performance increases and we're really kind of focused on establishing our vestibular systems focusing on the visual acuity focusing on our proprioception stuff so that is pieces that all take on different faces and different elements, but they all kind of work congruently to kind of come up with that same outcome. And as we get into it, right, what you're going to need today is two pencils or pens and an area where you can stand or move and some sort of comfortable environment. We don't want a lot of distractions. We don't want a lot of things going on behind you because this is kind of where we're getting into that neuroscience aspect and talking about the brain and why it does the things that it does. So there's a lot of different reasons and I, and I love the ones that some of you guys came up with, but as we kind of get into training in the brain, we think about how it just, it doesn't stop at the, at the field house. It doesn't stop on the field or the court or the rink, wherever it's, it goes everywhere with you, right? It's not just a physical feature. It is something that breaks down boundaries, breaks down barriers. And it, and it's something that we, we want to establish so we're successful, not only at, as an athlete and an elite athlete, but as a person and as a kind of a worker, a citizen, because it does help focus, it does help decision making, it does help that reaction time and vision, and really focusing on a lot of different elements that play a part in that. So our first challenge to you today is looking at a concentration grid. If you're not familiar, I'm going to put a link in the chat, but I'm going to give you about three minutes to see how far you actually get. It is a challenge to you. It is a challenge to see how many numbers you can get through. Um, really, the purpose behind this is to see how many numbers from zero to as close to 99 as possible that you can get. And when you're done, I want you to share your number in the chat. So real quick, there's a link in the chat for you, and you'll be able to access it then. So after going through that, right, that process, you'll often think about coaches telling you to stay focused, thinking, pay attention, you know, developing that mental monitor piece is huge in terms of what student athletes are going to grasp. And, and I'm sure you've said it as a coach or an athletic director or an organization before, it's how to best help our student athletes. But if we don't give them the tools or we don't teach them how to stay focused, or if we don't teach them how to pay attention properly and, and when and where, they're going to lose it, right? As an athlete myself that struggled sometimes with coaches directions or, or drills, it's it's something that's innate and we just have to figure out what that balance is and and what signifies in us as an athlete that tells us we're off we're we're not paying attention and we really need to refocus so we need to be able to establish those boundaries those barriers as well as those cues for ourselves in terms of how do we get back on track how do we get back onto what's supposed to be happening or what we're expected to do so real quickly in the breakout room i want you to kind of share with your group what stood out to you during that ex exercise? You had three minutes. I know a lot of you didn't finish. That's okay. I think a lot of you, you know, especially if it's your first time, it takes seven, 10, nine minutes, 
whatever, it's it's something that's unique and new, and you're creating these neural new pathways. So I want you to talk about if you were anxious, if you're excited, were you bored with it? Did you get distracted? And and how did you think you got back on track after you got distracted or whatever? I want you to share yourself or your ideas in the breakout room. So as we kind of come back, some of those ideas and things that I heard in some of those breakout rooms as I jumped around, it's really focusing on some of those distractions, right? I mean, we're, as an adult, it's very difficult for us to sit down, stay quiet and, and do this. I mean, I know for a fact that I have two kids, you know, one being one, one being four, it's very easy to get distracted, not only for them, but for myself because they're in need of something else all the time. So thinking about our lives, we always have our distractions, whether it be our family, our phones, our computers, something that's accessible that's going to distract us. And how do we eliminate those distractions? How do we stay concentrated? You know, what other things that will impair that? That insufficient sleep. As a parent of two small children, I definitely need more sleep, but it's very hard when somebody wakes up when they're teething or whatever. But as a student athlete, we think too, is social media and things that keep them up late at night, video games, they can all be good and they can all be you know beneficial, but there's an extent where it's affecting their performance. And, and that's also goes to that insufficient physical activity. So if you're not training enough, if you're not being exercising every single day or eating properly, you know, that's going to play a huge part in the way and the ability that we're focused. And we're going to get into that a little bit more, as well as the environment piece, right? Is your environment too loud? Is it too too bright, too soft lit? Is there is it too cold? You know, we have all these different kind of studies that go along with it, that go along with environment and how it affects our performance, usually in the education realm, but even in the in the sports realm, right? If you think about hot yoga, like that's a huge kind of trend, but it also can be very dangerous if you're not prepared or if you're not ready for it. So it's it's something along those lines that we really have to think about. Does it affect our body positively or negatively? And how can we really change that to, to make us our best selves? So as we get move forward throughout these breakout rooms and thinking about how we're going to get into that brain conversation, we have to have some background and some context. So really, as we talk about the neural pathways, we're gonna think about the lobes of the brains and the functions, the brain to body connection and pathway, the cognition and sport, and then the neuroplasticity. Because the brain is so unique and I don't really want to you know, get into all the details, you can Google a lot of this information as well, but I also want to provide you just with that context piece. So there's a lot more information that I'm probably skipping over and I'm sorry that if you're here for that, I apologize, but we're going to get into the other elements that make our performance a little bit better. But there is that background that I do want to touch on just so we get kind of that idea across. But Brains, they're a lot like hiking trails, right? I mean, living in Colorado, working in Colorado, we have to have that you know, affinity somewhere. So thinking about that grassy path that becomes flattened, matted and worn away every time a hiker walks over it. And if you focus on something with like your thoughts, your feelings and behaviors, you strengthen those brain pathways. So over the days and months and years, that well-traveled hiking trail becomes that worn pathway. And to compare this trail, and that is not a well-traveled or perhaps a faint trail made by like smaller animals or a less used trail, they might be noticeable to the naked eye, but they're not the hiking trails that we see in national parks, right? The ones that get the highest foot traffic. And so we think about why those trails are smaller, why those trails are larger. Is it because it's the most efficient way? Is it the most effective way? Does it lead to water? Does it lead to something else? Is it a prettier view? It's it's something that we have to kind of keep in the back of our mind to understand the more we think about something, the more we do something, the more kind of innate it becomes and the obvious it's easier, right? Because we don't have to think about it as much. And so we're creating those neural pathways throughout, throughout our lives to make our lives more efficient. And this is what happens all the time. And you'll start noticing these as, the more you think about them. And, and we're going to bring up some of them here in a second. So, we're going to kind of talk a little bit about these six parts or these six lobes of the brains and their functions right it's not necessarily they're not all lobes but at the same time these are the main parts that are going to be affected by some of the work that we're going to do today and 
when we think about brain activities and the cognitive abilities, including concentration, these brain training games and neural, the neural athlete work that we're about to do really focuses on short term memory as well as processing and problem solving. So you think about that frontal lobe, you think about the peridial lobe, the yeah, spittle lobe, and you think about how they all play in congruency and connected together, it makes a big difference. You can't necessarily just say one is going to be isolated or this is the only part of the brain that it's working because they're all interconnected. And that's why when we think about pathways, that's really what they are. They're pathways. They're not just like a A, B, C kind of points. And so they're creating different ways and different lines of thought and processes throughout the entire brain. So real quick, what do you see first? A lot of people see B, right? So I think that's a big piece when we think about this optical illusion, right? Where our brains are trained to read from left to right. So the first thing that we notice is B or ABC. And kind of in the tertiary and the secondary piece, we then see it as a 13 or 12, 13, 14. So we're we're so used to sweeping our eyes from left to right as we as we read. But oftentimes, because of this illusion, even though we can clearly see when we count go down, it's a 13, we just assume that it's a B. Our brain kind of perceives and has that kind of predicting and predictive notion to it and says, I'm going to say, this is what I think it is. And it makes that assumption that it's a B. And so when we think about this neural pathway and that brain to body pathway, right, it's a very predictive piece. Right. And so science goes behind it when it, we talk a lot about the exercise. And so with regular exercises, there's the release of chemicals and the memory and the concentration and increases sharpness. There's a lot of research on that already. It releases, you know, endorphins, dopamine, you know, serotonin levels, and they all affect focus and attention. So every time we exercise, the better at the concentration grids we'll get, the better focus we'll have in classroom or, at, you know, at practice. Those are all huge things. This is not a new idea and ancient Greece even used to do this and they kind of created this whole quote around the mind body connection and all these different studies from you know Western civilizations and so on beyond that found long ago that aerobic exercise does help the heart pump more blood to the brain, which means more oxygen to the brain and better nourished brain cells. But thinking about how exercise is almost like the same thing. Well, it is the same thing as, you know, doing those repetitions. We have to think about the brain as a muscle, right? Every time a bicep or a quad contracts and releases, it sends out those same chemicals, including a protein called IGF-1. And that travels through the bloodstream, across the blood brain barrier or blood brain barrier and the into the brain itself. That IGF-1 then takes the role of this kind of like foreman, right? Or this neurotropic factor, which is the BDNF. And that's kind of like the miracle grow for the brain, right? It's, it fuels almost all the activities that lead to higher thought. And with that, because of when we exercise and when we have that aerobic piece, because of those chemicals that throw into the brain or that are kind of bolstered by the brain, any type of exercise, whether it be, you know, for kids or adults, it puts different proteins into the body and it, and it kind of expels that that neural pathway. So until about 20, kids don't even have fully developed frontal lobes. So they recruit other parts of the brain to perform the necessary functions, including those involved learning. So the more you exercise at a younger age, the more learning happens, the more these neural pathways are connecting and they're building that brain and the pro those processes. So some of these activities that we're gonna go through later, you're gonna notice they're really focused on different elements of not only the brain, but that balance, that neurocognitive piece that really helps shape, shift and shape the, that learning way beyond that youth development. So we have to continue to use it though, and we have to continue to practice it. Otherwise, it's like a muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it and it'll atrophy and you can't rebuild the trails or, or you can build, rebuild the trails, but they're going to be worn down or not as worn down and you're not going to be as kind of thought or innate in use. So when we think about that neurocognition and sport, right, we, we break that kind of down into two different things. That neuro being the brain and the mechanics, and then the cognitive piece 
being that higher order executive thinking. So brains are built over time from the bottom up, and it's that basic architecture of the brain constructed through an ongoing process. It begins before birth and can use into adulthood. Like I said, at 20 years old, it's when that frontal lobe kind of stops or kind of halts growing. Those simple, simpler neural connections and skills form first, followed by more complex ones. And in the first few of, first few years of life, more than 1 million neural connections form every second. And after this period of rapid proliferation, connections are reduced through a process called pruning, which allows the brain to become more proficient and efficient. So you think about all those different elements. We talk about as you form neural pathways and you're kind of going through all these different processes, they become more innate and they become more routine. Like I come, I brush my teeth every morning, I shower, I wash my hair, I, you know, put my pants on left leg first every time. It's those things that you start creating these efficient systems for and your brain does the same thing. It's done out of habit, it's done out of routine, it's done out of predictability. But what if we were to change those things? What if we were to kind of challenge that status quo and be able to build those new neural pathways to make you more conscious of those thoughts, to make you more conscious of what's happening within your brain and why it's harder to grasp. So every time you're learning something new, you're trying to contextualize it in a new and different way. So if we think about, you know, Simon says in an athletic performance, I remember one of my old coaches used to hold up signs for some dry land training, right? So if I held, if he held up a blue card, the athletes would jump into squat position. If you held up a purple card, they would side shuffle to touch the wall. And then if you held up yellow one, it'd be high knees in place. He started adding more and more cards later on, but the kind of the same concept is there. It's that executive functioning piece that you have to assimilate this color to this action. And so we just have to, you have to really put your mind to it instead of just being like, oh, this is an innate action. He's gonna tell me squat, I'm gonna squat. But now it's a different kind of linguistic piece. It's almost like it's a vis visual piece, but it's still that same concept. It's, but it's in a completely different way and it's challenging the brain to think outside of what you normally would do. So one of these things, when we think about neural pathways and we think about neural cognition in sport is how VR is kind of changing the way we think about it, right? We're changing the way we prime our athletes and we really think about how we can create new pathways just by putting on a VR headset, right? So it's putting us in different situations. It's challenging that what we're expected to do and, and how we really get ready. So real quickly, I'm gonna watch, we're gonna watch this two minute clip on Neurotrainer, which is a VR program and, and software that you can use on the Quest or some other VR headsets. But what they're really focusing on is priming athletes, right? How does that, affect an athlete and how does it make them better so it's not just saying we're going to think in the positive way but this is challenging their visual their sight their line of sight their periphery and all those different elements so we're going to real quickly watch this clip and then we'll kind of discuss in a second so what are some of the highlights that you've seen that you feel like you can look out on on your players and say okay i believe neurotrainer has helped impact that uh, serve receive. I think it helps serve receive being able to track the ball early off the server's hand, mm. um, setting decision making. I think it makes a big difference there. Um, if I have that peripheral vision to see where that middle's going, mm -hmm. I have the ability then to make a decision on where I want to set the ball. Mm -hmm. um, attacking, I think your decision to your ability to see the block and see the defense and then hit where they're not is a big thing. Mm -hmm. And that all happens in like a tenth of a second. I mean, it's so quick. Um, defensively lining yourself up in the right position to make a play, I think is helpful. And there's all sorts of cues that are happening during a game that help you do that. I think that neuro trainer helps you make those decisions faster. Um, even like blocking, I just, I think there's a, a facet of every part of the game that neuro trainer can help. Have you heard feedback from any of the athletes about sort of impact of neuro trainer outside of the game, general help? You know, they feel like it helps them focus more or they feel like they're doing better in class. Has that come up at all? When we were using it more consistently early on, I've had a couple say that they thought they would come in and, and do it on test days. Hmm. Like they would go through flow on test days and they, cause they said it helped 
it. Like they felt more focused. It wasn't all of them. It was a couple of them, Mm -hmm. Um, but they did, they did recognize a difference in their performance on another day when they did it. And so Mm -hmm. they became a little bit more like more susceptible to like wanting to come in and try to train on a test day. Yeah. Um, I I didn't force them. I required them to train on game days. And so between after school, they would go get their food or whatever. And as soon as they came back, they had to neuro train, eat, get their stuff and then, you know, go watch the under levels play. So adding that little part in was, I think we paddle trained on game days. I'm pretty sure that's what we did. I think that's Um, right. But I think that also helped a little bit too. So neuro trainer is a great group and we've, we've, been in extensive talks with them and they know what they're doing and it's and it's awesome to see something that's kind of visionary and revolutionary in terms of vr and, and how it's really being approached by by athletes and and i know steph curry and other matt duffy and some other professional athletes are using the program we even had one of the goalies from the colorado avalanche come in here not too long ago to really see how it was and now he brought it to the nhl and he brought it to some of the his other goalies and, and people that he works with. So it's it's really cool to see the effect that it does have, right? It's not necessarily very tangible right away. And you see it over a long period of time. So what decisions, what what kind of vision and what kind of clues, cues, visual cues do you pick up on and notice that aren't always apparent? And so it's some of those, you know, smaller, longer lasting effects that that really come into play when it comes to performance based visual training and that kind of spatial neural pathway training. So that kind of leads us to that last piece of, you know, the, that, that back end of the contextualize contextualization of the brain. And so as we get come through some of this, that neuroplasticity piece, right? How are we creating new neural pathways? And so real quickly, if you're wearing shoes and you're, you know, at work or in the office or somewhere around, if you're wearing shoes, I want you to untie your shoe. But after you untie your shoe, I want you to retie it. And I want you to do it in a different way. And that could mean, you know, doing a different loop over the top, different, different style completely. But I want you to try doing it in a different way. And if you're not wearing shoes, try taking off your socks and folding them in a new way, like as if you're doing laundry and don't fold them the same way. I know some of those faces out there are probably some grimaces. I get it. It's, it's the end of the day and we're all not having the, the luck of the <laughs> smelling of good feet right now. So as you kind of go through this exercise, you'll notice that you're thinking and being more conscious of that approach, right? That's It's starting to come out and show like, maybe I haven't done it this way in a while, or I have to think about how I'm going to loop my my bunny ears, if I were teaching tying shoes kind of words again, but you're thinking about this in a different way. And that's what's creating those neuroplasticity pieces. You're retraining the brain to go in a different way or in a different direction in a different path. And so as you kind of go through this, that's called that neuroplasticity or the brain plasticity. When you're young, right at birth, your cerebral cortex has an estimated of 2,500 synapses. And by the age of three, you're at 15,000. But later on, you cut that number in half. Again, that goes back down to that pruning idea, right? You're going to cut away those weak pathways. You're going to cut away those ones that you don't need anymore because you found new and effective and efficient pathways within your brain. So tying your shoe, again, is becoming one of those routines. You don't have to think about it. You, you don't even have to look at it sometimes because you're so used to doing it. And so thinking about the brain in that way, how are we training our athletes? Right? Are we training them to follow a system consistently over and over and over again? What happens if we break that system? What happens if a defense knows that system and is able to exploit it? So that's when we have to create that new work or new pathway is if this person does this, if this person does this, where do you do? What do you do? Allow those student athletes to be creative and have that autonomy and agency to come up with their own success or to come up with their own different pathway and and allow them to fail and that's okay because that's when their brains are working the most not if you're telling them or screaming at them and saying this is how you need to do it or this is the right way yeah there's techniques and systems that we need to kind of coach but also we have to have that time for agency and we have to have that time for them to be creative too 
So now that we kind of got that background and the contextualized contextualization piece out of the way, we're kind of really thinking about how we're going to take advantage of that, how we're going to leverage those elements to really train the neural athlete, to really start beginning to think about those elements in a in a new light. Yogi Berra always said, you know, the game is 90% mental and 10% physical. But what happens when we don't train that 90%? Right. We do it indirectly, but never kind of directly in terms of let's focus on brain work. Let's focus on that neurocognitive work in sports. So as we go through this, I want you to think about how each of these kind of traits or each of these kind of elements play a part in your sport and how you're actually going to train them, what you're going to take away and how you're going to kind of reflect on this work, because it is going to be apparent. It is going to challenge and change the way your athletes perform throughout. So the first one we want to talk about is that visual acuity. And that is kind of our visual system that helps us make sense of what's around us, right? We have, it's our number one predictive system, meaning we always see what we think is going to happen. So we use that system to establish kind of like that framework of interpretation and, and that adjusts our reaction time. So anytime we see a ball coming this way, we're going to put our hand up to try to catch it. Right? We predict that it's gonna come here. Based off of all of our other sensory processes, this is where our hand-eye movement is going to go. Even without us thinking about it, it just innately happens. And so this is really how fast a brain processes what you see. And we think about this is in that sports realm is how do we see things in the periphery? How do we train for things that come at us in a different direction? What happens if the defender is coming up from us kind of in that back corner of our, our eyes or that eyesight and we don't see them and that could lead to injury, right? So what should we do? What should we be looking at? Should we continue to move our head around and all the time? I mean, I remember my coaches always say, keep your head on a swivel. Being on an ice rink and being a hockey player, it's pretty necessary because you go in a lot of different directions all the time. And in almost all sports, there's a lot of collisions. And so being aware of where you are in space and, and visually kind of adapting to that that's where you're gonna find the most beneficial and predictive kind of notions. So being able to train that, so you're better aware, you're better prepared for collisions, you're better pre prepared for different nuances, part of the game. So how, do you, how does your body react to that? And so one of the challenges that I'm gonna have you do is grab two pencils. And they could be a pen or a pencil. I mean, as long as they're somewhat similar, I want you to kind of have lined up. So you can see, a pen marker type of thing and what I want you to do is stick your arms straight out this way and slowly bring them closer together and try to touch the tips of the pencil pens or pencils right this is one of those activities that you're trying to do visually and use your periphery to to detect it's also going to be using using your depth perception and it's going to be using a lot of different proximitable or proximitable actionable pieces and timing everything. It's very difficult, you know, over time to, to get it. <coughs> Excuse me. So one of the times that I was talking with, you know, some of these other researchers and professors, but also some of my colleagues, we were, we were talking about the effects of this, right? If you're focused on it, it's almost more difficult. But if you weren't focused on the actual activity at hand and you're kind of talking or you're just doing it and casually, it becomes a lot easier to do because your body kind of understands and knows what to expect when you're trying to put your hands together because it has that same feeling. So with that activity, you have to think it's not that challenging, but it helps train that periphery. So as you kind of move your arms further and further back, it becomes a little bit more difficult. Try speeding up, try slowing down and seeing where that kind of works. There's so many different visual acuity kind of tests and, and vision kind of or sports vision kind of practices, but that's just one of the simple ones that we start off on. And this also gets that brain primed for the next step or the next level. So as you kind of see, there's another kind of visual piece that we're gonna talk about, but when we think about this next activity that you'll see, this is using the FitLight system. So if you're not familiar with FitLight, it's kind of like a, one of those like um, push lights that you'd normally see, but they're colored. And so you can program them to do different things, almost like a Simon Says, but you can place them around and they're, and they're very 
they're great um, piece of technology and they're a lot of fun, but they're also great in terms of that visual acuity piece and, and how to train. So it, it talks about peripheral awareness. It talks about that dy dynamic visual acuity, the depth perception, hand-eye coordination, color vision, contrast sensitivity, all these different elements, all within these kind of light sensors. So in this next clip, you're gonna see this athlete who has four different lights kind of posted up on this on these PVC pipes, right? And so with that, they're all different colors. And so they're gonna flash and he's gonna have to tap them. But then at that same time, he has to get his hands prepared for multiple tennis balls coming at them and he has to catch them all. So being able to adjust and adapt and being able to do this, it allows you to train your brain to not only multitask, but to do, you know, very little when it comes, or to do very little with your vision, it's just how your body is going to accept and process that information, how fast it is. So we'll watch this quick clip. So not being a goalie myself by any means and not like having the best hand-eye coordination, I'd, I'd like to think that I'm you know, pretty quick and pretty good with it. I don't think I could accomplish this. I think this is something that you have to train and, and get up to, but it's one of those things that, again, it's like a muscle. You, you work on different things and, and sometimes it's like, hey, touch a blue light, then you hit this, touch a yellow light, do this. And so you can change and direct the different elements that you want to train and focus on each and every time. And you notice how that coach who is bouncing the tennis balls or not necessarily all the time, but sometimes bouncing them, sometimes throwing them, sometimes it's one, sometimes it's two. So it's changing up those patterns. So your body is always creating these new pathways to, to establish and say, I'm comfortable with this. I'm not going to freak out. What if there's two? I, can I catch two? Where are you going to put your hands? You just automatically start practicing those things and just doing it because it's coming at you. It's new. It's something that's going to be formed over time. So we talk a lot about vision training, but it has nothing to do really with eyesight. And when we talk about eyesight, we talk about vision. It's it's very, usually they're kind of corresponding with one another and kind of are always talked about together. But the techniques is a form of perceptual learning and, and it's intended to improve that ability of what is seen, right? It's not the idea that the visual sensory neurons are like repeatedly activated. They're just increasing the ability to send those electrical signals to one another to connect and establish that synapses. So it's, it's really saying, I'm going to practice these peripheral things. I'm going to practice these dynamic visual acuity pieces, these depth perception things. And it's, it's functioning as a different element of vision, not necessarily of eyesight. We can talk about 2020 eyesight and the way that you see things and how clear you see things, but how do we react and process and how fast we, we react and process is really what we're talking about when it comes to visual acuity. And so that's something that we, we don't want to get confused with. And that's the, it's very difficult sometimes for for some people to understand it's like we're training vision today oh we're going to be looking at you know those those letters that you see at the eye doctor not necessarily. here's some other activities that we come up or not we came up with but that are out there that really establish those kind of frameworks right if you have something that you really want to to work on like there's different ways to visually train your eyes and, and to process things so the memory game, thinking about how often as children we were playing the memory game and, and thinking about where they were, how fast can we ac accomplish that. The lazy Susan, you can put letters or words or kind of charts, logos, symbols, whatever on doors on a lazy Susan that spins around and how quickly can you identify that one, how quickly can you you mark it and draw it and, and be able to identify these things in a movement moving way. And so when we talk about visual acuity, we talk about vestibular vestibular acuity, we're thinking about things in motion too. That's where our body needs to take time. Sports are never a standstill thing. So we need to be, have the ability to, to challenge ourselves and to prepare ourselves for things in motion. And so that's when we start processing things at a higher and faster and more effective rate is when we're actually testing ourselves in motion. So the Mike Wazowski, being a parent of a four-year-old, you know, have to throw some Monsters Inc 
references in there. But thinking about training with one eye, training with one eye covered, how can you, you know, do some of these elements just with depth perception? I know I wear contacts and I, I have different depths and or depth perception in each eye. So being able to train both eyes differently, it it has a lot to be desired and it, it can definitely throw me off for sure. And so be able to have student athletes do this and see which eye is dominant, which eye is less dominant. How can you kind of counteract and counter intuitive or not counteract intuitive, but how can you counteract some of those deficits? So remember something that's not being used you know, it's it's going to fade away. So if you're not using your left eye or if your right eye is dominant, how can you start strengthening your left eye in, in athletic performance, right? Have your student athletes help themselves by doing that. They can close their right eye if that's the, their dominant eye and then work on that left side because their body is going to react a little bit differently each and every time. Ping pong is another great one. We used to have a ping pong, you know, in our locker room or a ping pong table right in our locker room because that's what helped us prime for for our games it was that quick reaction time it was fast it was competitive it was something that we knew was going to benefit us we didn't know what back then but our car coaches must have but that was one of those things that helped us establish kind of some baselines in priming our brains in order to to perform at our highest level so as we get to the next piece that vestibular acuity right that really talks about that sensory information about motion equilibrium and that spatial orientation so it's like telling us which way is up, which way is down. And that's really focused on that inner ear, that kind of that the ear canal and what's that sense of gravity, linear movement and rotational movement. A lot of these sports that we are playing have that huge element that talks about balance, coordination and awareness and position. So thinking about that specialized vestibular and balance training, it takes skills that you've already learned and to a whole new level. And, and really thinking about how we can recover from injuries more quickly and how we can recover from concussion related dizziness or headaches and significantly reduce ankle and knee and hip strain during these dynamic activities. So thinking about this vestibular activity and how to find that balance in the spatial piece, we can do this through eye and foot coordination. We could do this through you know, identifying a path through the flying ball, looking over your shoulder and being able to run on an uneven field these elements, along with like the cutting motions and changing direction, it's how to understand your body and its balance and its space, right? As an adult, if you move your head and you spin and you like twirl a child around, you'll get dizzier than that child much, much faster is because we haven't trained our vestibular pieces as much or we haven't really, it, it changes over time. And so being able to identify some of those lacks or you know deficits, it's ways that we can start training to be you know, better at it and knowing that when you're coaching a football player to look down at the look at the receiver, but also know where the ball is in the air behind you and to to help defend it. It's you have to look back and then return to your sights to the or the receiver. It makes it much more difficult to do if you're not understanding your body and where you are spatially. So thinking about how you can train some of that is, you know, as you can see, one of those Wusu balls. Uh, or Bosu balls, the guy standing on in the in the picture. It's how long can you stand on your foot without losing balance or what on one leg? You know, can you stand on one leg, turning your head side to side? Yeah, this this talks a little bit about proprioception and and all that stuff too. But at the same time, it's doing it with your eyes closed. Can you do the same thing in all the same motions with your eyes closed? Once you start eliminating those different senses, that's when some of this work is really being done. So when we talked about covering one eye for the visual pieces, you could do the same thing. You could do the same kind of elements with one eye. You could do it with one leg. You can try it with one arm. And you'll notice a lot of these activities are gonna be similar. So training visual acuity and training vestibular acuity, you can do very similarly th similar things. And also prior perception, which we'll, we'll talk about here in a second as well. So one of the things too I wanna show you is, I know it's not really sold anymore, but these Nike Spark strobe goggles. They came out in 2011, but I'm pretty sure they had a pretty big epilepsy and seizure warning because when you look at them, you'll notice that they are, you know, strobe goggles. And so it'll kind of explain to you within the commercial of what they do. But this was something that was way ahead of its time in terms of training, right? It eliminated, you know, visual cues, but that movement piece. And when we're training the 
visual and vestibular acuity, you need to be, you know, activating both, right? You need to be moving your head and eyes to be emotion in order to understand the sense. You can't just be sitting still all the time to, to activate those because your vestibular system is all based on balance and your spatial awareness. So making sure that you're moving is the best way to practice some of this work. You are an athlete. You spend your life training to prepare your body to perform at its highest level. What about your brain? Nike Spark Vapor Strobe won't change the way you train. It will help make the way you train more powerful. Perception is power. Sensory training improves how you see the game and how you see the game affects how you play the game by not allowing you to see everything. The Nike Spark Vapor Strobe helps you see what you see better. Lock in balance. Anticipate action. React faster. Respond quicker. The Nike Spark Vapor Strobe speeds you up by slowing the game down. Open your eyes. Nike Spark Vapor Strobe. So I'm sure some of you can see why there is, you know, a seizure or epilepsy kind of warning on these, but it definitely eliminates some of that predictability, right? You, for one second, your vision's gone. For one second, your balance could be gone because you don't know where in space you are. So being able to take away some of those elements and those senses, it really helps your body understand what it's doing and where you're at. So once you're taking them off, you're that much better prepared for some of those unknowns and some of those variables that could come up. And so being able to train something like this, there are still strobe goggles out there. I'm not necessarily always recommending them because we don't necessarily always know how successful they can be with people that do have seizures or are more prone to it. And we don't want to risk that with people that have post concussion syndrome as well, because that can definitely affect them medically. So be very wary, but there are definitely different vestibular activities out there to, to challenge and try. So one of these elements that we, we tried before too, for to kind of start a baseline is the yes, yes, and no, no VORs. So thinking about VORs, that's a vestibulo-ocular reflex. And as you have your pen or pencil out from before, I want you to grab that same pen or pencil and almost put your arm directly out in front of you, straight up, and stare at the tip of the pen or pencil. And then, I want you to move your head backwards and forwards, keeping your eyes and your pencil and target at this very same level. So a lot of times when we do this movement, you'll notice the neck move too, and your body wants to move, right? That's one of those elements that we have to keep practicing. So as we do this, you're kind of noticing that your vision changes. You might go down to your dominant eye. You might, especially in your no-nose, you're definitely gonna be looking in here, but how do you keep your body positioned with proper um, alignment and your neck in proper alignment as well? A lot of times we'll lean back with our neck and not necessarily just the head. And so you're just tilting and flexing the chin up and down. So those are things that we wanna work on when we're talking about the vestibular ocular reflex. That's a very simple activity that I want you to challenge yourself to do on a more regular basis, especially if you're sitting at a desk all day. That's one of those things that we, we like to work on just because it kind of challenges the, the balance, it challenges the vision, it challenges everything else that we don't necessarily do on a regular basis, which we probably should do more of. One of the next pieces too is, this is how I want you to challenge your athletes. As you get more comfortable with challenging some of their their vestibular systems, think about the next step. So kind of from a simple to a more complex piece. So what they're going to do is find a target almost very similar to a pen or pencil, but a target on the wall, as you can see in the image there, you're going to see, you know, there's diagonals, there's um, a lot of lines, but all kind of center around this one circular target. And the man in front is jumping rope. He's doing those same yes, yes, no, no VORs, but while jumping rope. This is a lot more difficult than it seems. And so try to do 30 degrees while jumping rope, both all directions, 
horizontally and vertically, it's a little bit more challenging. Your body wants to shift and your body wants to turn and it becomes a little bit harder to do so. And so kind of keeping control, okay, making sure your body knows the mechanics of jumping rope, making sure you're following with the, the VOR elements, and then also being aware of your neck movements and your, pro your posture and your proper alignment. So thinking about how that's working, that balance system and the way that you're reacting to you know, hits, baseballs, like football movements, all the things that move at really high paces and rates, we have to be kind of more centered on and understand because we're gonna be moving in, in, in motion. So having that jump roping activity along with these simple VORs makes it that much more challenging and difficult and more applicable. So thinking about at the very bottom as a question you might have seen on the, one of the previous slides for visual acuity is how would training vestibular acuity help athletes in your sport? Think about like specific outcomes. And so with each of these kind of elements, I want you to think about how would this actually help my student athletes? How would this actually help my organization become more mentally prepared or more primed for elite performance? We have to work on this on a regular basis and not necessarily just focusing on these elements just to focus on them once. It's a trained system. It's not something that we just do once and it's it's all good. It's it's something that we work on continually throughout this, the, the athletic season or even throughout the year. So next element is that proprioception, right? It's that crucial in all sports. It allows the athlete to dribble a soccer ball and run without looking or thinking about through each step. It allows a volleyball player to know where the ball is and to spike it. It's really that one's own perception, right? It really kind of talks about our own perception and our own position in space. It's very similar to the vestibular piece, it, but it's a little bit different because it has nothing to do with the ear canal, right? It allows us to know, you know, where we are in our position, our body positions without knowing exactly what we're going to do. So just like, you know, on the screen, you'll see it allows a person to touch their nose without with having their eyes closed, right? Whether they're the feet are on a hard surface or soft surface, whether they're, they're on an unstable surface or, you know, on an imbalanced surface or sorry, like an unstable, like a incline. So thinking about proprioception, it's it's a little bit different, but it's very similar. And it relies on the relationship between the body's central nervous system and certain soft tissues, like in muscles, tendons, ligaments, and so on. So that's what's going to help us prevent common injuries and prevent, you know, injuries, re-injuries like ankle sprains. So a lot of basketball players, we need to be working on this type of work because of the high probability of high ankle sprains and ankle sprains in general. So thinking about different ways to, to challenge proprioception, right? The most common form of balance and proprioception training is that instability training. So you can go on inclines and instable, instable grounds. So if you're an athlete, you've already probably done this at some point in your career. So on the pic, on the screen, you can see some of those, those air pads that they're trying to balance and do single leg squats on. It's very, it's very similar, right? You have to find ways to create new and in different neural pathways by creating instability. And that training involves situational imbalance. So unstable surface, which can be provided by those BOSU balls or BOSU balance trainers or TX suspension trainers. But by reducing that stability, you challenge your central nervous system to control your body in space. So therefore improving that proprioception. And when we're able to keep control of our body in some of these instable spaces, you know, thinking about getting hit, thinking about driving to the basket, thinking about running through a gap, it's those types of elements that we're going to get more used to. We're going to understand what our body's doing and how we can counteract those movements. You don't see, you know, NFL running backs going into 350 pound linemen and being scared or timid because they know they're going to get knocked off their feet. They're ready to go and they're putting their head down because they know that they're going to be able to find a way to balance and go through some of those tackles or try to break some of those tackles just by moving their legs and knowing where their body is in that space. So one of those challenges that I want you to try, there's a kind of a, a gif there to, to guide you, but it's called the one-legged three-way kick. It's much easier said than done. And so if you had the ability to stand up, 
push your chair in or get out of the seat and try this. This is something that you can work on. I know the GIF looks like it's it's going pretty quickly, but when you have these the ability to try to stop your foot in each position at the kind of the tip of the front kick, the side for like two or three seconds, right? Those are one of those challenges that you think sound easy in practice, but until you do them, you don't really understand sometimes the difficulty and the work that goes into it. So try both feet and see which one's better, right? It's one of those elements that you're definitely going to have a stronger leg or a definitely stronger sense of balance in one foot or the other. And, and that's what we want to work on. This can also happen with, you know, single leg cone drills and where you kind of do a single leg cone pickup, single leg deadlifts and squats. A lot of people will add those weights to this, but if you can't do this without weights first, then don't do it with weights. So if you see trainers or student athletes trying to do certain things like this with with weights, it's they, that could lead to serious injury, just making sure that they know that they're aware and they can do this properly and do it with proper technique prior to doing it with a weight. So again, think about your sport specific outcomes and how they could effectually impact them and what what would be most beneficial? What types of movements, what types of instability is gonna be most beneficial for your student athletes? You see, there was a, um, sorry, there was a clip on Russell Westbrook yesterday having, getting mad and frustrated with his trainers because they weren't pressuring him hard enough. They weren't pushing him and putting body pressure on him as he was doing training. They had arm extensions for his basketball. They're kind of leveraging and pushing off of him. And he wanted people to push him harder than what they were doing. If athletes are asking for that, you need to listen and be able to do that and and have them challenge themselves to to be off balance, to shoot off balance, to be able to perform in some of those more difficult situations in the in the hardest of positions. Our last but not least kind of sensory piece is that interoception, right? So real quick, I want you to take a moment and close your eyes and try to feel the heart beating in your chest. Can you, without moving your hands to take your pulse, like feel each movement or count a rhythm? Can you just detect any heart rate at all? So this is just a simple test to assess your interception, right? Your brain's perception of your body's state. So if you can't understand your blood or your, your heart rate or your, your pulse, a lot of times you can't, but sometimes you can have that same feeling, be like, I'm calm, I'm aware, I'm, I'm sensing that I'm not breathing heavily or I'm not anxious. And so having your, the ability to understand that makes all the difference when it comes to elite performance. And then if you know that and being aware of it, you can counteract some of those elements. So being able to train some of this work is it takes time, but it's that kind of that mindful approach. I know it's like that holistic athlete in the way that we really take in our own selves and our body awareness to then alleviate some of those stresses and anxiety and the kind of common factor that we have that performance anxiety, right? So many of these sensations like the tension in our muscles, the clenching of our stomach or the nervousness, it's part of our conscious mind and we have to be able to understand it, right? The way that we read and interpret these feelings and that will have important consequences for ourselves and our performance. So interoception is like extraoception, but it operates in the service of movement predictably or predictably. So think about like your motor commands that adjust inside your body. It simultaneously predicts the sensory consequences for those movements. So if you were thirsty and you just drank a bunch of water, right? Within seconds after draining those last drops from the cup, you probably felt less thirsty. It might seem normal, but the water actually takes about 20 minutes to reach your bloodstream. So it can't possibly quench your thirst in just those few seconds. But what you re what relieved your thirst was that prediction and what that predictive piece did. So if your body is predicting something or you should be anxious or you should be able to perform, then it's something that's going on mentally and how we're doing that. And how can we change that pathway from being anxious and being, you know, perform have that performance anxiety or depression or confusion to a more beneficial element? How can we change that to, to excitement, to 
to accepting and forcing ourselves to chal our, those challenges and being okay with that. So it's, it's definitely understanding and being more aware of your body and those systems. The interesting thing about the interception is it affects so many different things. And if I asked you right now how, you're, how you feel inside your body, could you legitimately tell me? It's difficult, right? I don't know, you know what's going on. I'm, I'm probably sweating a lot because I'm presenting in front of a screen in front of a lot of people. But at the same time, I know that I've done this before. Is my heart beating fast or slow? It's kind of the, in the middle. I've done this and I'm confident and it's, it's okay. I'm not as tense, but do I need to use the bathroom? I definitely need to use the bathroom. So inside my body, my internal organs are telling me, you should probably go to the restroom soon. But can I control that with my thoughts and mind? Yeah, absolutely. So think about an athlete perspective, right? What happens to them when they're in a new and uncomfortable situation? How's their body responding and how are they going to interpret that? Are they nervous? Are they anxious? Are they excited? Are they bored? Are they, you know, are they losing interest? How can we help them overcome that to get them to where we want them to be? So those are those small little things and those nuances that we really need to start coaching and thinking about what happens in this situation? What happens? How do you feel? What, how would you react? And, and so on. It's not about challenging them to fit into your system in that sense. It's challenging them to fit into how they feel and really fit into their body and how they're going to interpret this new data coming in and this new perception and this new kind of element. And so instead of challenging them to fit into that system, if they were had the ability to be creative, how would that make them feel? If they had the ability to come up with their own strategy on a, on a breakout or a fast break or so on, what would that play look like? And giving and empowering them to do that is going to come up with a lot of different feelings than if they struggled or missed a certain technique or a certain system, certain system play. And, and I think one of those aspects is, yes, systems are good and plays are good, but if we can't rebound or if we can't have a student athlete regroup after they make a mistake, then what's the point? We need to be able to coach all of our athletes up and be able to do that in the most positive way and having them understand what they could have done otherwise and how they could have interpreted and perceived some of that information is then what's going to help them the most and help them be more coachable and help them become better athletes because they know that they can make a mistake and they're okay with that and they can improve their themselves as well as their bodily or bodily awareness. So what happens when an athlete has the ability to recognize anxiety, confusion, or lack of motivation? Like I just said, right? It can, we can help coach them. It can help bring that self-awareness and how we can teach them to overcome. They can come up with strategies for other players and help you know their teammates get over what they've gone through before. So they'll be able to notice it in others. It's almost like that empathy building piece. So it builds up kind of that, that teamwork and that team idea and, and those similar elements because they're more aware of themselves and their position in that space. So what, right? We have all these things. Now we have kind of that awareness of each sensory system and how we can really approach it in terms of performance, right? You can work on breath, right? That interoception piece. Knowing how you're breathing is gonna really impact your, your blood pressure, your heart rate and so on. And so breath work is huge. I think it's, um, Aero is a is a company that almost has like breath mouth guards that do breath training for for high performance athletes. So if you're really interested in that and breath work, it's really important and showing how that can really improve not only endurance but improves anxiety and performance anxiety in 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 elite athletes. So that visual acuity and seeing that's that number one predictive system. Being able to work on that that balance piece with the vestibular Acuity. Working on that is huge in terms of your your space in in your mind and in the work that it does within your ear canals. And then that pro proprioception pieces that move in the field in that kind of sensory term of stability and balance on that kind of almost that extrinsic or extrinsic side there. So my question to you is what will you do differently at your next practice and how are you going to stay accountable? Right? This is something that I want you to think about and really focus on really doing your best at 
implementing something new that focuses on the mental cognition piece, the mental piece of the game. Not necessarily just only physical traits or doing single leg squats all the time, but what are those elements and what is the purpose? What is the intention behind them? And how can you really make your student athletes know what they're doing and why they're doing it? You might get some weird looks at first, but then they're gonna see that performance increase and that excitement because of that performance increase really change. And that's gonna help build a lot of different elements for you. One thing I wanna throw out there before we kind of, kind of finish up here is we are launching our MSL Capital Retreats. So if you're interested in joining us starting in 2022, since we're back from our you know wonderful pandemic years, we're gonna to try to join in some in-person retreats. Please reach out with some questions, but coaches need this, right? We, we always know we need time to reflect and we need more space and time to think about our organization and which direction we wanna head. This is where we can do that. So please reach out if you have any questions. I'll give you, send out my email here in a second. But overall, I want you to be you know, excited and think about asking questions about this, but this is something that we're going to launch early in 2022, and it's something that I'm really excited about. Um, so please take our quick survey. I'll drop the link in the chat. If you see it on the screen before, you can click on the QR code or scan the QR code and also go to the same web page that kind of talks about our feedback form. That helps us understand what you guys need. Um, gives us ideas for future clinics that are, are always going to be free for you guys, but please leave us feedback. It, it helps us grow as an organization and it helps us learn what, what's needed from you coaches that are doing it on the front lines as well. Again, my name is Davis Turner. I'm the Senior Director of Strategic Programs at MindSpark Learning. Please feel free to contact us at mslcapita at mindspark.org or davis at mindspark.org if you have specific personal questions for me. But other than that, thank you guys. It was a pleasure and I hope to see you guys soon.